So um, let's acknowledge for a moment Mother's Day. Uh, gosh, this, there can be different feelings. You know, as you know, we're foster family and uh, adopters, so we know that there can be complicated feelings around Mother's Day, and it can be joyful and it can be difficult. But we all had one, and some of us are one. So uh, let's let's get on and. Uh, and, and have a think about, uh, about our world. Because um, we all know that any mother of any level of competence will from time to time attend to their children's cleanliness, right? So uh, on those balmy summer evenings when I stick my head out and go, it's bath night, um, you can imagine. Yes, they, they come rushing. They go, oh yes, that's what I really, really want. Um, or just before church or school when you're realizing, oh my goodness, that porridge is halfway down your front and you were clean and now you're not clean what are we going to do so you kind of you get the dishcloth out and <laughs> rubbing it over their face and you're doing up the buttons on the cardigan to cover up that splodge um, it's not always popular and uh, when it comes to teens it's more of a sort of a, a, a nudge than a shove into the bathroom. Actually, for some of them, it's actually trying to drag them out of the bathroom, isn't it? But, uh, but sometimes they do need a shove um, because we're encouraging their independence, yes? Yeah? So we kind of, we buy nice products that will kind of get them in there and we do what we call a flyby. We go, oh, I think it's bath night. Um, oh, when did you last have a shower? Never mind. Um, in fact, we had, um, we had a, a, a lad that, that lived with us for some time and um, Nick is not his real name, but I'll call him Nick. And Nick, bless him, I think he had sort of anxiety sweat because this poor child did frequently smell. He had to wash more often than the others. And I've got to, actually, I've got a certificate that JJ did me, which is on the inside of one of our cupboards in the kitchen. Um, and it says this, um, congratulations, mum, you've accomplished the politest way in the world of saying you stink to someone. I probably said something like, oh, uh, Nick, I'm sure your friends will be even keener to be around you after your shower or something like that. Um, but we do, we do have a responsibility. I was a teacher for a while and uh, I taught dance and drama, and after a sweaty dance session, they would all put their uniform on, refuse to get into the showers that were provided, and then they'd get sort of cheap body spray and spray it on top of their clothes. If you've been around teenagers, you know they do this. Um, not very positive, but eventually you do get them into the bathroom, and then you have to just close the door, give them their privacy, and trust that they're going to get on with it. Um, so we have to nudge them. And this morning, um, as one of the spiritual mums in this house, I'm going to give us a nudge towards the bathroom, if that's okay. And then the privacy and trust that you will get on with it. So that's, this is the idea. Because we're, we're in this, uh, I would say a series, but it's not a series, it's a journey towards being real. And I don't know about you, but I'm already being transformed by it, as you can see, by my lack of shoes. Yes, I'm being real. I can feel the floor. Thank you, Dan, for that. I've got the permission <laughs> because Dan's done it. He does it all the time. I can do it from time to time. Um, and it's about authenticity in an image-obsessed world. Because here's the thought. I believe, and you can wave at me or nod or mmm or even amen if you agree with this, our generation is self-obsessed without self-knowledge self-obsessed without self-knowledge. So we obsess with covering up the more distressing aspects of ourselves, whether we think we're too thin or we're too fat or um, we're too flabby or we're too young or we're too old uh, or we don't have enough friends or uh, you know, we're not outwardly um, successful in our career, um, maybe we're not blissfully happy or dare I say it, we're not always even nice. Yes, some of us aren't. So we cover up, cover up, cover up, you know. Uh, and this problem, this problem cannot be solved by doing up the front three buttons on your cardigan. Um, so we spend time and money um, and effort that we can't afford controlling the narrative. Yes, not sorting ourselves out, controlling the narrative, posting pictures, preferably with filters so that my tired, dry, stressed skin looks dewy or um, uh, buying clothes that, that flatter. Um, a friend recently told me that you can get body contour jeans that take all the wobbly bits and put them in the right place. <laughs> Who knew? This is great news. Uh, <laughs> and we 
even maybe speak cautiously so that we're not going to cause offence in case our opinion on something doesn't quite match someone else's opinion so we try and make out like we've got everything in common and there's no conflict and then of course we don't have robust conversations where someone said actually we had a great one in our small group didn't we a couple of weeks ago someone said something and I won't say what or who and someone else said oh I'm not quite sure about that and then we had a little discussion and then we kind of came to a new place together it was fantastic so don't forget small group. Um, another way of actually uh, covering up is to deflect. So point to the faults of others. Um, so blaming, judging, and gossiping is a great way to do this. Okay, excellent ways. Look at Adam and Eve. Okay, we had Adam. He eats his share of the apple. He's got juice running down his chin, and God asks him about it. And what does he do? Does he say, ah, oh, you got me? No, he says, it was Eve. Look at her. Look at her over there. That woman, that woman that you gave me. Ah, I can blame both Adam and I can even blame God. Yes, but it says God never tempts, so there we go. By the way, you know when you go, oh, I'm only human, as an excuse, as a sort of a cover-up. I did the wrong thing, but oh, I'm only human. God never tempts, and we can't really criticize him for making us who we are as humans, can we? Um, and then, of course, if the deflection doesn't work, there's always Adam's choice Self-talk, you've got this, you can do this, I've got this, I'm going to be independent. And it takes a bit of effort, but it's so effective, right? Really effective. Life hack right there. If the real me isn't the person I want you to think I am, pretend. Yes? So, we can go for coffee now, yes? That's the talk, no? <laughs> Let's see what God says. So, he says in Romans 12, Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters... <laughs> In view of God's, sorry, can I just pray, Lord, could our hearts be open to the truth of your word? Help us not to think according to the patterns of this world. Amen. He says, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. That concept of a living sacrifice. Surely a sacrifice, it offers itself up for death and then it's dead. No, we are a living sacrifice, constantly, repeatedly offering ourselves. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing and perfect will. Can you move it on, please? Okay. For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith that God has distributed to each of you. I love how scripture exists to speak into even the invisible problems that we face. Because this is a key scripture. It's been placed in the Bible by a God who knows that we're going to need it. Do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment. And this isn't just for the people who are puffed up, a bit arrogant, a bit up themselves. It says, I say to every one of you, this is something that we are all going to face. He knows that... The pain of low self-esteem and broken dreams and shame hurt so much that we are going to be tempted to find our own solution, and this is it, to think more highly of ourselves, to swap faith in his unconditional love for us, warts and all, and to hide in a fantasy that convinces others, yes, but even convinces ourselves that we are better. Um, we boost our egos. And we improve our ability to cover up our faults and protect ourselves from the pain. It is a pain of being broken, faulty human beings, which is what we are. Don't mention it, though. Pretend. But if we can't even mention our faults, how are we going to manage them? If we're not even willing to let them into our minds. And the Bible isn't silent on this. King David says... Who can discern their own errors? Forgive my hidden faults. Keep your servant also from willful sins that they may not rule, that they may not rule over me. So hidden faults is a thing. 
Uh, this is bad news in a generation which cowers away from shame, which says that if you're feeling shame, then there's something wrong in your mind. You should not be feeling ashamed of yourself. And in fact, actually celebrates shamelessness. Oh, you're shameless, you are. Yes, but actually, shame is the proper place where the gospel starts. We need to know that we are faulty. The bad news is that being faulty is uncomfortable. Um, and as we learned last week from Dan, the Bible does not say do not be uncomfortable. It says do not be afraid. You have to be willing to be uncomfortable. The bad news is that humans have used the free will that God gave us to become pretty bad. That is the diagnosis. But the cure for the bad news is the good news. The cross and resurrection. But the good news makes no sense without the bad news. There's no point saying to someone your sins are forgiven if they cannot acknowledge their sins. And of course we can see from what David says that these sins are sometimes hidden. But hidden faults is mentionable. God does not shy away from them. This means that hidden faults are manageable. Now, can I just say I'm not talking about weaknesses. God gives us weaknesses. We are supposed to have weaknesses. My weakness is covered by Fabiano's strength. My weakness is, is met in a God who is sufficient. When I'm disappointed in myself because I have an, a thing that I can't do, he hasn't made me to do it. I can appreciate it in someone else. I can appreciate God giving it to someone else. And I can appreciate my need. Because he wants us to be codependent and solely dependent on him. So I'm not talking about weaknesses. Weaknesses are good, but hidden faults are bad, <laughs> and they need restoration, which is God's plan to, to restore us. So hidden faults is what we're gonna be thinking about for the rest of our time this morning. We're gonna look at four different kinds of hidden faults. Hidden faults that we can't see, that we're unaware of. Hidden faults that we know about, but we're hiding them from others. <laughs> Hidden faults, now this gets deep, that we're actually hiding from ourselves. And then finally, hidden faults that we bring out of hiding. So we're going to go, go deep here. So let's start off with hidden faults that we can't see. So non-Christians have loads of these. Um, these are sins that non-Christians don't even know are sins. Um, so Saul in the Bible, classic example, he goes around persecuting Christians, putting them into prison, and thinking that he is doing the right thing, that he is righteous, until he meets Jesus. And that's the difference. No one in this room would think that, you know, persecuting others from their faith is okay. Um, but Saul genuinely did before he became Paul. And I'm so glad that doesn't happen today. Yes, there's laws to protect us from being persecuted to our for our faith, right? I'm so glad that we don't get persecuted. For example, when we're running for the um, First Minister of Scotland for having a born-again faith. Yeah, isn't it great that that doesn't happen? I'm so glad that uh, no one gets called a hate-filled bigot for believing that marriage is sacred, that it's for life, um, and that it's between a man and a woman. Yes, yeah, isn't, it, isn't it great that we live in a world that protects us? Yes, I'm so glad that no one would accuse people of faith of traumatizing someone simply because they acknowledge that God is a master creator who made us male or female, and that there's no moving between. These are progressive concepts that society believe are right Yes, yeah, so it's not the same as the hidden faults of a Christian. Um, but those outside the church, they need to learn that you can also progress in the wrong direction, as any map reader will tell you. Yes, they are progressive, but that doesn't necessarily, well, it doesn't mean that it's right. We, we need to be willing to be known and persecuted for the good news. Yes, uh, and also be aware that non-Christians think that, that what they're doing is right, but they will be judged by God apart from the law for who they are and how they live. But Christians also can have hidden faults. Um, here's David praying, forgive my hidden faults, yes? And I don't know about you, when I came to faith, I was a mess. Um, and he is gradually straightening me out. He doesn't show me all my faults at once. That would overwhelm me. You're probably more aware of some of my faults than I am because he's keeping them from me until I'm strong enough to face them. 
but he patiently lets me know day by day through, we need to tweak that, we need to dial that down, we need to lift that up, we need to forego that, we need to pursue this. God is so good. And he's given us his word so that we can discover where our faults lie. And this is why new or immature Christians that don't read their Bible have so many hidden faults because they haven't been exposed to the whole of Scripture. This is why we need to read the whole Bible, beginning to end. Um, And it doesn't matter how long it takes you, but be aware the bits that you haven't read are the bits that you haven't allowed to redeem your soul yet. So we biblically educate our conscience so that we know what is right. And we are willing to let the light of scripture show us our hidden faults. But let's not think of ourselves more highly than we ought simply because we're not aware of our faults yet. Yes? So that's the first point. Second point, next we need to think about the faults that we keep hidden from others. They are there. Yes, we know they're there. Um, But we hide them because we don't want other people to know that we pick our noses, say or that we get irritable or a bit judgy or that we fantasize over what we could own if we had a bit more money or sexually. And these are seriously tricky little blighters for us as a community because they stop us from truly connecting with one another. There's nothing to see. These are thoughts and attitudes and desires. Now, I don't see you trawling the internet for unmentionable images. I don't see you ducking into a massage parlor or making eyes at your colleague because these are hidden faults and they're hidden. And of course, lust isn't the only one. There are some less obvious. Um, if you take, say, ingratitude. You know, I don't hear you complaining. Maybe you only do it in your head that your spouse or your parent doesn't earn enough, that you wish you had a bit more disposable income. No one sees you rolling your eyes at the gift that your child made for you and you think, where am I going to put that one? And you, you know, you look at your older child or your spouse to kind of go, huh, another thing. And there are people that long to have a child that would make them an ugly thing to put on their shelf for the rest of their lives. You know, it's ingratitude, isn't it? I don't see you googling unaffordable houses or furniture or trainers in your spare time. Because the hidden fault of ingratitude is hidden. I've been teaching Eliza about weeding recently and explained it's not enough to just pick the leaves off the top of a weed um, because the root is unseen and it will grow again. But we can get so good at taking the leaves off. And in fact, we can just do it as we're just passing. So we don't even remember that we did it. And eventually we forget that there was a root even there that needs to be dealt with especially if we can point to other people's more spectacular faults. But look, there's a palm tree over there. (laughs) Yes, a bit more deflection. C.S. Lewis wrote this. You are enabled not only to be, but to appear. That's great, isn't it? And the more we work on our ability to appear the stronger that competency becomes. We get better and better at appearing and such that we can forget about the root that we need to dig up. It's quite relatively easy work to cover up, but it's not dirty work and it's not deep work. Hidden faults are like a pebble in your shoe that they make the walk uncomfortable and you can't concentrate on the view. They're like a... I have a lovely uh, silk blouse and it's got a stain, a a splash of red wine. And I can tuck it in and it looks fine. But it kind of, it plays with my sense of I'm dressed up smartly for this occasion because I know it's there. I know I'm being inauthentic. Like a single dandelion on the lawn. Our hidden faults take seed and then they multiply. In fact, hidden sins are much more likely to compound in further sins like lies and hypocrisy and other sins um, that we need to do in order to keep the act up, to keep people thinking that we are what they think we are. And then when we get away with it once, well, it either produces some fear, oh my goodness, I need to keep this up because now they think I'm this good, I can't possibly disappoint them, or arrogance, I got away with it that once, I can do that again. And we become more committed to the inauthentic path and then desensitized and emboldened 
and self-reliant. And at that point, we can back off from God. We stop praying, God, help me kill this sin. Because we can cover it. We can cope with it. Psalm 66 says this. If I had cherished sin in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. So cherishing sin means to sort of appreciate our ability to sin without getting into too much trouble. Yes, so we sort of embrace our ability to sin. Um, And maybe you don't believe me that Christians actually do this, but I'm, I'm... You'll have met a Christian, I'm sure, who can boast in the old that they can handle their drink. Yeah? Cherishing a sinful ability. Um, People that rather enjoy it when someone else shoots off a kind of a witty put down. And we all like to laugh because, oh, that was such a rude, naughty thing to say. And we, we enjoy laughing together about it. We cherish it. And my own personal favorite, I confess which is I rather enjoy my ability to know where the local speed cameras are and I can speed up to them and then I look in my mirror and I slow down and I'm safely going past them and I think, aren't you clever, Fru? I'm going to, I've got to stop doing that now that I've said it in public, haven't I? Um, but you know, until I'm not safe, until I decide that actually that law wasn't worth following and maybe there's another one I can get away with as well. Because hidden sin requires us to sear our conscience, the Bible calls it. Stop thinking about right and wrong. Am I doing the right thing? Am I authentically right here in this moment? And rather think in terms of survival, cherishing our sin and working to hide it from others, which is both effortful and futile, actually. Jesus is this. This is really sobering. Nothing, happy Mother's Day. <laughs> nothing, is, nothing is covered up that will not be uncovered. And nothing secret that will not become known. Therefore, what you have said in the dark will be heard in the light. And what you have whispered behind closed doors will be proclaimed from the housetops. So let's not keep sinning simply because no one knows about our hidden fault yet. Because they will. So thirdly... Let's look at faults that we're hiding from ourselves. Now, um, a lot of you will know that uh, I have an interest in understanding how the human brain works. I like to know the chemistry, the anatomy of the brain and think, how does it affect our behavior? Um, And so I looked up self-deception and I read some studies on it. And this was the most um, concise uh, one. Self-deception is a state of mind that involves a combination of a conscious motivational false belief and a contradictory unconscious real belief. Yeah, I've kind of felt that way as well after I read it, so let me unpack it a bit. I've been looking at this this week. So um, simply, um, if you think that you are incapable of self-deception, you are probably more vulnerable to it than someone who thinks, oh, actually, I can do that. Yes? But we all deceive ourselves from time to time. The real question is, how long will it take, and will it be in this lifetime, for you to realize where you have deceived yourself and been unwilling to accept the truth? Because what is mentionable is manageable. And when we do this, we can bring these things to God. We're told to think of ourselves with sober judgment. That means we're open and willing to see where we haven't seen before. And that means as the youth would say, for real, for real. Yes, it's about being for real, for real. The word tells us that the heart is deceitful above all things and is extremely sick. Who can understand it and know its secret motives? We can deceive ourselves. And that means that we are, according to the self-deception studies, we are holding two Uh, ways of being and thinking in our mind at the same time. The one that is thinking positive and, and, and covering up and choosing to see the world the way it wants to. And then the other side that says that actually there's something I'm, I'm ashamed of and I'm not this person. And there is a tension between these thoughts. And carrying that tension um, is what happens. And I have developed this hypothesis recently that the effort it takes to appear 
the one way, when we actually believe that we're worse than how we appear, might be the root of this anxiety epidemic that is striking the next generation particularly, particularly our youth. Um, I'm not sure if I'm completely right, but to me this makes sense so far. Um, there's this unbearable pressure on youth and, and older people as well, but particularly youth, to appear to toe the line on everything that really matters. So they're supposed to share the same opinion as the narrative, whoever wrote that, um, on deeply important matters, even if they don't. And there is this incessant virtue signaling in the TV programs they watch, in the movies. Well, there are two programs this week that I've just thought, oh, I really liked the first episode of this, but now, oh my goodness, what are they trying to convince me of here? That, you know, sex before marriage is actually completely harmless and normal and healthy and not going to mess up a teenager? I can't watch that program anymore. Yeah? So abortion, gender fluidity, sex and relationships, all these... All these opinions, the, the young people feel that they're supposed to hold these and that if they don't, that they're full of hate. And because they realize, but I'm not full of hate, so there must be something wrong with me having this opinion and therefore I have to pretend that I have it until I have it. So they're not even disagreeing with it. They're just sort of putting it in a holding space until they've worked it out because there's a lot of things to work out, a lot of really good things like what are my talents, what's God planned for me? And they can't even talk to each other about them because as soon as you start to talk, then they're accused of being hate-filled. And so this tension is causing this anxiety. It's like this, this constant friction that's going on in the way that they're thinking. And even our faces are supposed to be more uniform, aren't they? Have you had a little bit of work done? If you haven't had work done, why haven't you had work done? Come on, a little Botox here, a little a plump there, and a reduction here, and an extension there. And the, the formula of this face that our children are supposed to have is so uh, slightly varied and, and non-specific that it is impossible to achieve. And so there's this, this anxiety, I'm not right, I'm, I'm, I'm off a bit, I don't know what's the matter with me. And this is the work of the devil. And he's clever, but we need to catch up and call him the liar he is. He is not an equal force with our God. That is apostasy. Yes, it's not God does this and the devil does, oh no, the devil's winning. No, the devil has lost. But we do need to call him out and recognize him for who he is because he's crafty and weak. You are enough. Your godly opinions are not hate, they are love. They are created by the God who is love. He doesn't just do love, he is love. And he put your face together exactly as he wants it. And it's beautiful. And there are as many different kinds of beautiful as there are human beings he ever created. And our weaknesses were cleverly designed by him to make us fully reliant on him and codependent co on each other. And in fact, admitting our weaknesses is actually quite becoming, isn't it? When you say to someone, oh, you're so good at that, I'm just terrible at that. It draws you together, it doesn't push you apart. So we get to our last category, hidden faults that are brought out into the open. We have faults, we hide them, and sometimes they're willful, and they're rightly called out as sin. They're not the God-given weaknesses, they are faults. And here's some good news, God cannot be reconciled with your faults, but he can and will be reconciled with you. Your faults are mentionable and manageable and they are paid for in full. So are we ready to search them out? Remember I said there was gonna be a nudge towards the bathroom, but no one's going in there with you. You need that privacy. Are we ready to repent and be transformed and set free? David prayed this awesome prayer. Search me, O oh God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. <laughs> See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. 
So we yield to God's way. And the way is not a footpath. It's not a track. It's not a road. The way is a person. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. The way is your way. Forgive my hidden faults. Keep your servant also from willful sins. It says in the Proverbs, take away the dross from the silver and the smith has material for a vessel. We want to be used by him, don't we? And he wants to take the dross out of us. God, we're yours. We ask you, God, to drag our faults into the light. Yes, God. We want to be the same on the inside as we are on the outside. God, we're your servants and we're your friends. Show us, Lord. Lord, we are your exquisite material created for a higher purpose. And so we come confidently and boldly before you to become all that you want us to be through and through. I'd like us to just return to that initial scripture. And I wonder if I've been doing this little experiment this week. When I get up in the morning, I sit right on the edge of my bed. So why don't you sit right on the edge of your seat? <laughs> And I pray this prayer based on, on this scripture. Lord, I offer my body as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to you. This is my true and proper worship. I won't conform to the pattern of this world. And with your help, I'll be transformed by the renewing of my mind so that I can test and approve what your will is, your good, pleasing and perfect will. I will not think of myself more highly than I ought. But rather, I will think of myself with sober judgment according to the faith you've given me. So forgive my hidden faults. Keep me also from sinful ways. Search me, O oh God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. <clears throat> 